Hello, everyone. Good morning. I think we should settle down, although more people may come in. I know that there's so much to say to one another that uh, we could probably just uh, chatter for an hour and a half, and very productively, too. Uh, my name's Nancy Cott. I'm delighted to see you here and to... Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. And to share with you the, uh, the excitement, the energy of this conference. Uh, uh, <laughs> not for me, but one of my younger friends uh, said walking in, I feel like I'm at a reenactment. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> uh, well, we are here to hear a uh, really a dynamite panel of six voices talking about narratives of the women's movement and uh, what uh, what they have told us, what they have missed, how we should think about this history. Um, let me just say before I begin to introduce at all that everyone should know there is a plan for 1230 out in the uh, lobby in front of where the registration desks are to take a picture of everyone here, a, a, a group selfie. So try to assemble yourselves there at that time. Well, we have fortunately had from one of our panel members, Sarah Evans, a terrific introduction to our panel as a whole. Now, I know that some of you may not have heard that. I hope most of you did. But she introduced what we are dealing with in, in large sense by talking about the way the history, the, the true history of the women's liberation movement has been eclipsed or effaced along with the history of much of went on in radical social movements in the late 60s particularly. But that insofar as it has not been erased or effaced, it has been uh, memorialized in certain myths that are quite misleading in uh, in younger people's understanding of what the radical women's movement was about. So all of us are here today to try to ad address that and to correct it. And we will have everyone on our panel speak very briefly, about six minutes is each person's time, so that we then have plenty of time for give and take from the audience, because I'm sure many of you have comments and questions to raise to further uh, uh, make our discussion really productive. And the panelists are going to speak not in alphabetical order, but in an order that seemed to enable their particular topics, their particular foci to flow in some sort of a reasonable line of thinking. So I'm going to introduce everyone very briefly now there should be somewhat more developed biographical sketches on the conference website if you want to look into it. But I will introduce them, and they are seated in the order in which they're going to speak. Then we'll proceed with each one speaking after the other, and then move to more of a, um, a multi-log, not just a dialogue. First, we'll hear from Ruth Rosen, who is Professor Emerita of History at UC Davis. Uh, she's a former columnist uh, in the Los Angeles Times and San Francisco Chronicle, and she's the author of the history of the women's movement called The World Split Open, How the Modern Women's Movement Changed America. She's currently a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley. Next, we'll hear from Roz Baxendahl, who is an American Studies Distinguished Professor Emerita from SUNY Old Westbury, and she now teaches at the CUNY Labor School she was part of New York Radical Women, Red Stockings, and Witch, which was the women's terrorist conspiracy from hell. Um, she was a member of each of these groups, and then also later a member of No More Nice Girls, which uh, protested issues around abortion rights against sterilization abuse, and uh, worked to create daycare centers, public green spaces, and also helped to desegregate want ads as she's also written books and articles uh, about the women's liberation movement. And uh, a heroine of the past, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, as well as a really great book on suburbia. 
Uh, next, we'll hear from Robin Spencer, who is assistant professor of US history at Lehman College in the Bronx. She uh, has a book forthcoming from Duke University Press on gender and organizational politics in the Black Panther Party in Oakland. And she's currently working on a project about bl black liberation politics and the movement against the Vietnam War. Then, fourth, we'll hear from Astrid Henry, whose work you may know, it's called Not My Mother's Sister, Generational Conflict and Third Wave Feminism. She is also one of the three co-authors of a forthcoming book called Feminism Unfinished, a short, surprising history of American women's movements, which will be out later this year. And she is uh, a chair of women's studies at Grinnell College. She teaches gender, women's, and sexuality studies and is currently working on a study she must be researching right here, feminist subjectivity and historiography in memoirs of 1970s feminists. Then next is Dion Espinoza, professor of Chicano studies, liberal studies, and women's gender and sexuality studies at Cal State LA. She's also the coordinator and advisor to the women's studies program there. Her work centers on Chicana activism, gender, and feminism, and she's completing a book on women's involvement in the Chicano movement, especially dealing with how Chicanas negotiated the gendered models that the movement proposed for them. She's also interested in third world feminism and Latin American feminisms, as well as current feminist activism by third and fourth wave women of color. Then we will conclude with Sarah Evans, who will have some thoughts to add beyond what she had to say this morning. She is, as you would have heard earlier, Regents Professor Emerita at the University of Minnesota, and of course the author of the now quite iconic book, Personal Politics, The Roots of Women's Liberation in the Civil Rights Movement and the New Left. She, uh, there are many, many other accomplishments to her name, which I will not mention, but simply to say that she is another member of our panel who is both activist and historian. She was part of women's liberation, both in Chicago and in the Durham Chapel Hill area. So we will proceed beginning with Ruth Rosen. Thanks. It's so much part of my identity that I was involved in the civil rights, anti-war, and women's liberation movements in Berkeley. I forgot to put that down. <laughs> For me, um, the story of all women's movements, as well as I think their great accomplishments, is when we learn to free ourselves from silence. We learn to name injuries and grievances for which there had been no language. And once you name an injury, you can debate it. And once you debate it, you possibly can change law. And once you change law, you possibly can change socially acceptable customs. I could start anywhere in world history, but I'll start in the modern women's movement with Betty Friedan because she was the person who talked about the problem that had no name. And what she meant by that was the meaninglessness that was experienced by young, educated housewives who felt a lack of purpose in their lives. But Friedan in that book largely addressed white middle class women, which is of course the reason it became such a big seller. But other members of the movement from different minority groups, different classes, and I want to reinforce the point that Sarah made this morning, so many women looked like they were white and middle class but came from working class families, but college made them look like they were middle class and that they could speak like middle class women, and the movement gave them, as she said, movement building skills. Other members of the movement named other problems. I think this intellectual history helped, helped us free ourselves. We redefined rape as an assault rather than as a sexual act. We changed the workplace by calling predatory behavior as sexual harassment, and we made it illegal. We transformed domestic life by arguing that wife beating, which was considered a custom throughout the world, was in fact illegal. 
We also changed domestic domestic violence, we changed wife beating and called it domestic violence, which made it felonious assault. We did the same with marital rape and with date rape. These are phrases that were never uttered before the women's movement. Who knew what marital rape was or date rape? At the same time, women from so many different parts of American society and the world began simultaneously and sometimes a little later in the 1970s, they began naming very specific hidden injuries that were experienced by women who were workers in factories, women who worked in unions, domestic workers, by minority women who experienced racism and sexism every day of their lives. By 1980, women around the world, not just in this country, had identified new women's issues. They talked about fuel and water as being a women's issue. By the, by the, by the late eight, eight, uh, 1980s, they also talked about ending genital mutilation, honor killings, and dowry deaths. By the mid-1990s, this is a very fast forward view of all the renaming that took place. The UN had declared rape when committed during a military conflict to be a war crime. At the same time, the UN declared that violence against women and girls was, in fact, a violation of their human rights. By 1995, this is really 30 years after the people began gathering to form now, and just a little fewer years, the women's liberation movement, Hillary Clinton could say at, Be at the Beijing conference that women's rights had become human rights and that human rights were women's rights. This is one important narrative, I think, in the history of the women's movement. Without naming these injustices, these injuries, these grievances, we would never have changed anything. We would never have acted upon them. And we certainly would not be here today. Thank you. I'm gonna talk about was the decentralization of the movement on balance a strength or a weakness? The women's liberation movement was a decentralized movement, unlike now, which was and is a traditional centralized movement with a voted on leadership, Robert's rules, dues, offices, national conferences, systematic notes, statement of purpose, agreed on policies, and allowed men in their groups. Uh, the women's liberation movement's ideas on decentralization, leadership, and organization came from the fact that women were dominated by men in many of the groups they joined and didn't want to copy these oppressive structures. Feminists wanted to invent a more feminist, democratic alternative, but we never came up with the right one. Although we experimented with several, like giving everyone at the beginning of a meeting 10 poker chips, every time a woman spoke, they got rid of a chip. So at the end, only the reticent ones with many chips spoke up. At the same time, the anarchist counterculture, SDS participatory democracy, and the civil rights movement influenced our ideas. In several cities, there were citywide organizations, Boston formed Bread and Roses, Chicago, the Chicago Women's Liberation Union, and Chapel Hill Dorham, the Female Liberation, and there are others I don't know, I'm sure. Citywide groups combine both centralized and decentralized organization. Did groups with citywide organizations last longer than decentralized groups? I think they did. Groups with more formal structure like now certainly did. But at the beginning, now wasn't part of the new left social movements. Its roots were in the old Communist Party, but they denied those roots. And movements don't usually last more than a few years. Decentralization, like lack of leadership, seemed a real advantage at the beginning of the movement. 
because it let a hundred flowers bloom and led to creativity and variety. The early meetings were like a hallelujah <coughs> chorus, new insights poured out of us. Centralized organizations like now are better at organizing huge masses of women like the August 25th strike for equality, but we joined in many of their action events and now adopted many of our practices like consciousness raising. Um, now was more directly responsible for changing employment laws, although they help create, um, uh, although we help create the Supreme Court decision Roe v. Wade, but neither now nor women's liberation could keep that law intact. Now in certain places like the Midwest had more women of color and more trade union women. A good example of the need for more centralization was New York City's beginning group, New York Radical Women, after the second year. Due to the Miss America protest and some TV appearances, New York Radical Women kept growing larger and larger. People dropped in and out. True, there was a group of maybe 30 regulars who attended religiously. The drop-ins didn't know what had gone before or what had been decided. Many people also found the size of the group unwieldy. Finally, New York radical women couldn't decide on what to do and by a close vote broke up into several groups by lottery. People then didn't like their chance groups. <laughs> and others eventually formed, like Red Stockings, The Feminists, a media project, which New York Radical Feminists, Up From Under, and High School Women's Liberation, and Child Care, and many others. The new groups ended up to be more or less closed, so new women, unless they were friends, couldn't join, a decided disadvantage. Some groups, like Red Stockings for a while, recruited new members. There was a problem in recruiting new members because often they had no left or movement experience and no sense of our generally accepted but never specified anti-capitalist anti goals. Another huge problem in New York, the media capital, was uh, a, about leadership and centralization. The press made stars of women who said outrageous things that the press ate up and milk toast liberal homilies, <coughs> but were not active participants in any group. With lack of structure, it was difficult to grow or even act. I think the lack of structure and decentralization also caused chaos and many splits. Certainly, we couldn't withstand the backlash from the right without structure. We also undermined underestimated the power of the backlash and weren't prepared for the long haul. But Centralized Now did no better. A decentralized movement makes it harder to write about because the files are all over and many not even in libraries. Also, being ultra-democratic, women didn't even sign their names in those days. It's gotten somewhat easier with the internet because many of the publications are being put online. The glue that held the women's liberation together was the shared magazines, leaflets, and pamphlets. Good morning. Okay, I wanted to share some of some, some insights from my work on radical black women, black panther women, black women who are on the left, and transnational activists. And also just the fruits of, of some grassroots activism I'm doing around bringing black women's stories, radical black women's stories into community spaces. So I'm gonna address the question of what's been left out of movement narratives and which way forward? What are some ways forward that we could think think about moving forward. In 1988, in an essay called Sick and Tired of Being Sick and Tired, Angela Davis wrote, quote, politics do not stand in opposition to our lives. Whether we desire it or not, they permeate our existence, insinuating themselves into the most private spaces 
of our lives. Black women activists who are veterans of the movement of the 1960s and 70s have not collectively given voice to their struggles within the movement. Part of this may have to do with coming from movements and communities already stigmatized and a sense of loyalty to a narrative that erases them, such that the erasure or burden itself becomes another burden, another movement legacy. Scholars have been complicit in this silence, preferring the militant, strong black woman with a hardened exterior without questioning if a blackened eye lay behind her sunglasses or asking her about her pleasure politics. Yet the contours of these black women's stories appear faintly in the margins of their memoirs. They're recounted by their sister friends when they have passed. The stories are told in their own unmediated voices, the letters they shared, what they articulated in poems, the self-portraits they painted through their autobiographies. These sources reveal the struggle to care for their children in the movement, a lack of self-care, loneliness, poverty, substance abuse, physical abuse, sexual violence, imprisonment, colorism, sexism, class divides within the movement, loss of partners through imprisonment or death, and so on. These are not the movement politics that get, typically get exalted or examined with such microscopic precision. But don't we also need to know about the insides and the ends, the ins and the outs? This is also her story. May Mallory was an activist who uh, was a mother in Harlem. She worked on gaining educational betterment for her children in the segregated schools of Harlem in the 1950s. She went and supported Robert Williams, black nationalist NAACP leader in um, the early 1960s. She was imprisoned after a period of exile, she came back and she was active in the 1970s and 80s um, in New York, um, pretty much until her death. In 1977, she wrote the following letter to Julian Mayfield, quote, in all seriousness, I can appreciate the seriousness of high blood pressure. At this very moment, I'm supposed to be on complete bed rest. My pressure was 210 over 150. The doctor said he didn't know how I managed to walk around. He even suggested that I might not get home to my bed and should be hospitalized from his office. Now how could I go to the hospital in the land of the free, or better yet, the free world, when it costs $40 just to attend a clinic at Kings County Hospital, which is in Brooklyn. Luckily, I'm doing home nursing and my, parents, my patients are very easy, easy to take care of. When they sleep, I sleep. One patient is 96 years old, so she sleeps most of the time, and this allows me to rest. My pressure has gone down. I hope I can keep it down. This letter reveals the impact of struggle and health and poverty in the work of a formidable movement legend turned elder care provider, not an unrelated trajectory. Broadening this perspective will not only impact black women. I remember reading Susan Faludi's uh, article in April 2013 in The New Yorker about Shulamith Firestone. And it was as much about interior politics as societal transformation. It included bouts of poverty, mental illness, and stint on public assistance. Deeply felt sisterhood and deeply felt betrayal. It was a full accounting. I await black radical women's full accounting. Someone who is both activist and angst-ridden. Someone whose health struggles are acknowledged. Allison Park has written a wonderful article about Mary Church Terrell in this vein exploring how and why she suppressed and hid various health problems, including depressing and, de and debilitating stillbirths. So perhaps tools from health and disability studies can be employed in this project. Yet it's unsurprising that everything known about Terrell, and despite the, the prominence of the politics of appearance in her own life, no one has written about this. I await a holistic biography of a radical black woman whose subject is revealed to have both politics and sex. <laughs> In The Problematic of Silence, Evelyn Hammonds wrote, 
quote, we know more about the elision of sexuality of black women than we know about the possible varieties of expressions of sexual desire, end quote. She wrote that in 1999. Not to overlook the violence and racism that frames black women's sexuality and the need to connect race, sex, and violence, but this is not all there is. Right? Even in the darkest hour, black women resisted, enjoyed desire, and all the other messy stuff of life. I find myself more interested in teasing out those stories these days, because otherwise, how are we not simply just victimized by history? Where is the joy? Is there a space beyond the semblance? Could it be accurate to view the civil rights and black power movement as a kind of sexual revolution in tension and tandem with the women's liberation movement? Panther leader Erica Huggins asked in a poem, in the end, when all is history and we are wherever fate has taken us, what will it look like? How will it be summed up? How will you have become all of us? I wanted my intervention in this conversation to be a radical rethinking of the process of summing up what has gone on in these past uh, social movements. I go to conferences and I engage with black power politics and social movement scholars and I speak about black women. I go to conferences and I engage with issues of gender and sexuality, and I speak about black women. Yet, despite the fact it's 2014, it still feels like all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us still have to be brave. In 2014, radical black women are still in search of their mother's gardens and waiting their full accounting. Thank you. In the late 1960s, when the women's liberation movement began to emerge in the United States, few feminists connected to this new movement to the early, few feminists connected this new movement to the earlier struggle for women's rights that had begun at Seneca Falls in 1848 and continued through the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Not only did this earlier movement seem permanently located in the distant past, well before the lives of the 1960s feminists, but in addition, women's liberationists knew very little about it, having been educated prior to the development of women's history and women's studies as academic fields. In her preface to the 1970 anthology, Voices from Women's Liberation, editor Leslie Tanner writes, quote, as I gathered papers and became more involved in putting this book together, I became aware of the historical aspect of women's liberation. I found out how little I, and most women I talked to, actually knew about our heritage. A minimal amount of research soon showed me how deliberately women had been left out of the history books." End quote. This lack of historical knowledge was echoed by other writers of the period, including Shulamith Firestone, who asserts in the dialectic of sex that women of her generation, quote, for all practical purposes, did not even know there had been a feminist movement, end quote. The situation is quite different for those of us who have come of age after the women's liberation movement. Raised in the wake of the feminist movement of the 1960s and 70s, this generation, or generations plural, has inherited feminism as a kind of birthright, reaping the rewards of its accomplishment, accomplishments. As one such feminist writes, quote, we are the first generation for whom feminism has been entwined in the fabric of our lives, end quote. Many of us learned about feminism through hearing the stories of this movement from older feminists in our lives, including our parents, and through studying its history in college and university. For this group of next generation feminists, the women's liberation movement has often loomed large, defining the meaning of feminism, of activism, of radicalism, and of politics with which subsequent generations must contend. In my opening remarks today, I would like to very briefly identify three contemporary narratives about the women's liberation movement and how each has shaped the feminist identities adopted by members of the next generation. My comments are grounded in the belief that the stories that we tell about feminism's past, the way that past is remembered, recorded, and passed down to subsequent generations influence the meaning of feminism in the present. 
The first narrative depicts the women's liberation movement as the height of feminist activism in US history. It was a movement that changed everything, from the consciousness of the average woman to the laws and policies that governed her life. It was a movement that caused, as Ruth's book is titled, The World to Split Open. If the women's liberation movement was feminism's peak moment, it follows that nothing that comes after it will ever be quite as revolutionary. <laughs> this, is, this perspective has led many next generation activists to express a sense of sadness for what they have missed, as well as envy for what they will never get to experience. As one generation X feminist notes, quote, I missed by fate of belated birth my chance at partaking in the mm -hmm. high noon of feminist activism <laughs> in the early 70s. Being too late also means missing out on the chance to share in the self-confidence that feminism seemed to ooze in its early days, and means missing out on the self-assured buoyancy with which feminist social and political activism in those days boldly de declared to overthrow patriarchy everywhere." End quote. Comments such as these highlight how enshrining the women's liberation movement as feminism's defining moment can seemingly only lead to loss and nostalgia. A second narrative describes the women's liberation movement as inherently flawed because it was a movement largely by and for white middle class women. In this view, the women's liberation movement was, at best, unable to live up to its utopian goal of a universal sisterhood, and at worst, a racist form of feminism, which failed to address how white privilege and white supremacy shape feminist practice. For some next generation feminists, this narrative of the women's liberation movement has led them to make claims, such as this one by a contributor to the 2002 anthology, Colonize This, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism, quote, the predominantly white and racist feminist movement of the 1970s ignored the relationship between racism, classism, and homophobia, end quote. While depicting the earlier movement in monolithic terms has facilitated next generation feminists' claims of progress in their critique of feminism's racism and their intersectional analysis, such arguments have also obscured the role of feminists of color in the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s by whitewashing this movement. Finally, a third narrative of the women's liberation movement focuses on its relationship to the other social justice movements of the era particularly the civil rights and anti-war movements, in order to stress how all political movements are inevitably a product of their particular historical context and the particular activist tools available at the time. The women's liberation movement emerged at a time of unprecedented political activism around the world, one which led many feminists to believe revolutionary change would soon become a reality. While many of the issues addressed by feminists today remain the same as they were in 1969, all feminists today, whatever their age and generational location, operate in a world that has changed dramatically in the last 45 years. Political cynicism and economic despair have dampened our belief that the revolution will soon arrive. New organizing tools like the internet have changed what activism looks like and what it can accomplish in the 21st century. Some younger feminists had even gone so far as to argue that online feminism is, quote, the largest innovation in feminism in the last 50 years, end quote. They point out that while women's liberationists were able to work with small groups of other feminists in local consciousness raising groups, feminists today are able to connect thousands of activists around the globe in real time. Rather than glorifying the women's liberation movement for its accomplishments or condemning it for its failures, this narrative has stressed how feminism must always, to, must always adapt to the new political realities it faces and the new tools at its disposal in order to continue the fight. Okay, so I'm here actually in place of Maylee Blackwell, who published the book Chicana Power, Contested Histories of Feminism in the Chicano Movement. So I hope that you will um, read her book and its contribution, and I'll touch a little bit on it here. So first, I want to thank Linda Gordon for inviting me to participate in this conference. She was one of my mentors when I started at UW-Madison. I'm now at Cal State LA. I also, uh, when I was invited, had to invite my homegirls. And as a result, two of my wonderful colleagues, Maria Cotera and Linda Garcia Merchant, are both, who are both doing outstanding work on Chicana feminism, they're here, and their mothers are here, Martha Cotera and Ruth Mojica Hammer. 
And both of these are women who have made major contributions to the women's movement and to Chicana feminism. In fact, probably the first monograph on Chicana history was Martha Cotera's book, Diosa y Embra, The History and Heritage of Chicanas in the U.S., published in 1976. With respect to the historiography of women's liberation, I want to say thank you to this conference first because clearly we're not going to narrow down the movement to the National Organization of Women or Liberal Feminism, and I think that's where the white and middle class narrative really kind of comes from. Uh, there seems to be in the programming a leaning toward more radical feminism, grassroots feminisms, and what I would call community-based feminisms, which is most relevant to Chicanas, and this is where we are most likely to find women of color. At the same time, quite honestly, and with all due respect, I am having that deja vu feeling the feeling Chicanas of the 70s must have had of being the minority voice in the conversations and platforms of women's liberation. It raises the question of the need to decolonize the narratives of women's liberation and to create more spaces for those deep dialogues, those hard conversations about race, for example, that uh, Sarah Evans brought up. Now, many panels um, do seem to move us in that, in that direction and I hope it will continue. I also have to add an aside that um, I'm really kind of defensive when people talk about the third wave feminists and how we don't get it. And actually, I consider myself more of an in-between waves because I strongly identify with women of color, second wave going to third wave feminism. But we need to move on from that. It makes me defensive, but I also sense a defensiveness from the second wavers. I'm just going to say that. And I think we have to ask, what are the mechanisms that have put in place a certain fixed narrative of uh, women's liberation as white and middle class? Who is to blame? Do we blame the third waivers that we have gotten a certain view? It has a lot to do with the mass media. And um, I personally want to go on a more hopeful bent. I want to move beyond the generational conflict narrative and call for more intergenerational dialogues. Because I need these histories and our fourth waivers, I'm going to use that term, I use it in my class, they need these histories as well. And you know what, they're creating their own histories. I see a lot of exciting work in Los Angeles. So with respect to this idea of decolonizing the women's movement historiography, more and more I'm starting to think it's better to say there are many different narratives, and we, each one has its purpose and teaches us about another piece of the whole. There is no totalizing narrative, and those that exist have been exclusionary or have often constructed Chicanas as belated subjects of feminism. Now, why might this be the case? Let's, let me think fairly about this, right? Why have Chicanas been uh, to some, and other women of color been invisibilized. Well, Chicanas, for the most part, stayed in their movements, the Chicano movement, and they formulated new spaces of Chicana feminism. So as opposed to this idea of leaving uh, the sexist organizations, and maybe uh, Sarah Evans will comment on that, Chicana stayed within the movement. Why is this important? It's important because it does mean a completely different way of thinking about what constitutes women's liberation for women of color and how one theorizes a movement. So I echo many of scholar Maylee Blackwell's insights and critiques in a chapter of her book entitled Spinning the Record, Historical Writing, like writing out and writing, making things right. And in this chapter, she calls for a historical approach that opens up the way of studying feminism to make visible the work of women of color whose engagement in the movement was an engagement in multiple movements at once. What I have found indeed is the need to think more about how Chicana feminism was foundationally intersectional, and I've heard critiques of that term, and I'm not talking about intersectionality of identity here. I'm talking about activist intersectionality. So Chicana, Chicana activists, Chicanas, you know, doing kind of women's liberation work, they were often doing things in ways that were parallel, bridging, and intersecting. Small groups like Chicana Colectiva, Las Chicanas, Concilio Mujeres, Hijas de Guatemoc, the Chicana Caucus, to name just a few, were grassroots, strategic, and interventionist, and they also very much exemplified a working class and community-based feminism. What we often find in these small groups, it's very similar to the dominant narrative, of, uh, or not dominant, unfortunately enough. I think we need to keep looking at those small group work and consciousness raising. Uh, but we find that there were, they were often political education seminars that women did amongst themselves. Here I'm thinking of the work and as an example of Enriqueta Chavez, who as a member of Las Chicanas of San Diego State, which was also part of the Chicano student movement, she insisted upon spending time at the meetings discussing reproductive health and the body, and then they created a class within Chicano studies on this same theme. So Chicano feminism was and is a women's liberation movement. These groups, these small groups, worked in multiple ways to fortify the concept of Chicano feminism as a distinct and meaningful consciousness of women's liberation, and also to affect changes both in the Chicano movement organizations and in uh, the larger women's movement narrative. 
So I'm going to end by talking about two projects uh, that are going on right now that are very exciting. So one of them, uh, a project amongst Chicanas is to document, 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 recover the archive. And I hear people saying this in general for women's liberation. And so here is where the digital archiving project Chicana por mi raza, founded by Maria Cotera and Linda Garcia Merchant, is going to open a new world for these multiple narratives. It's going to be an online archive that allows for, they're just gonna put the information out there and then out of that people can create multiple narratives. And then two, the other project of course is to create those narratives. There will be no master narrative or I don't know, maestra narrative maybe is a better one, yeah, right. <laughs> the teacher narrative. Um, but instead there will be multiple stories and I think this is gonna be the best way to ensure the visibility of Chicanas within the Women's Liberation Project. Thank you. I, I sort of had my say earlier, um, so I don't think I need to talk too long uh, now. I'm, I so appreciate this panel and where it's taking us in terms of the, the kinds of agendas that we need to have for um, reclaiming these stories in their fullness. Um, and the, the one thing that I wanted to elaborate on that picks right up where Dion left off is the need for more local studies. We've got to understand how this movement worked at the grassroots level. And um, I, I think, you know, we have a bunch of books that are more about New York than anything else. The New York narrative tends to dominate. New York was interesting and wonderful and innovative and powerful and problematic and people have written about all of that. The only problem is when that is seen as the only story. Mm -hmm. And so we have to fix that and it's happening now. So I just want to point to the richness that can occur the, one of the first things that's happening is we are getting these different narratives of different parts of the movement. So it's, you know, Chicana feminism, these multiple strands of feminism that in fact were relatively invisible to each other because they were inside their own movements for a long time. And um, I want to accept the, the criticism if the way I talked about things made younger women feel defensive. There is no way for those of us who feel like we're being misrepresented not to say, wait, we need to tell this story differently. On the other hand, there's also really no point in trying to say you did it wrong and you did it wrong and you did it wrong. It's let's get the story right and let's do this together. Um, let's read each other's stories for one thing. So I just want to point out some of the richness that can come from going back and trying to do a city, for example. Now, I mentioned earlier that Carol has done this New York, um, Florida link in her book. Quite a while ago, Judith Ezekiel wrote about Dayton. Judith, are you here? All right, I'm not gonna, there you are. Um, she set a really different pattern for us by tracing from the get-go how this movement grew in Dayton, Ohio, right, you know, Midwest. And what she finds there is in fact not much of a now chapter. She finds women's liberation that grew and morphed into all sorts of other things over a period of time. Suddenly things pop up that don't show up in some of the narratives like feminist theology. Boom. I think religion actually gets left out of our narratives a lot. Um, it would be interesting to compare that to what Stephanie Gilmore has written about now in Memphis, where she finds a lot of radicals in now. And I do think this funny, funny alchemy happened where many women went looking for women's liberation and what they found was now. And so all these now chapters were full of women looking for radicalism and so they did it there. Um, and so we gotta watch that, those dichotomies. Um, 
Barbara Winslow is one of these days going to give us the story of Seattle, which has a, a different story of link to the left. And I can't tell it. Barbara can. Barbara, you're here. Right. And she's got a big display out there. Um, so I just want to point that out. Um, and I also mentioned Anne Finn Inkey's book, and several people came up to me and asked about it later. It's called Finding the Movement. She compares, and, and this is where uh, an innovate, innovative local studies can just take us in, new, give us new eyes, new lenses. Um, what she did was compare Detroit, Chicago, and Minneapolis, St. Paul. So they're all Midwestern. They are incredibly different from each other. And she has a capacious definition of feminism. So she ends up looking at black lesbian softball teams, which became models of powerful womanhood for a white lesbian softball team that was just getting going in Chicago out of the Women's Liberation Union. Um, and she also um, looks at what happens spatially. She, she talks about public spaces that where women weren't allowed or expected or were considered inappropriate, like public parks with ball fields, and who invades them and begins to take them, claim them as appropriate for themselves. What happens there when women create, take over buildings, like left on pearl, and claim the space and, and reshape it, and where those spaces are in relation to the urban environments where they were has a lot to do with who comes and uses the clinic, the bookstore, the whatever gets started there in ways that I think the people involved themselves at the time didn't necessarily intend. The stories about um, shelters for battered women and rape crisis centers, are those are places where women came together across race and class. No matter who started them, that's what happened in those institutions. And sometimes there were real struggles uh, because people didn't know how to talk to each other or didn't understand each other's perspectives. And then they start having to do that. This is just a call for more work to, to push the, our understanding down into that grassroots upsurge. Um, not because it was better than anything that's ever happened, but because it happened. And we are starting in a different place because of it. And there are things to learn from that. And even those of us who were in it, we were in some little piece of it. And any one of us can it, it, take our piece of it and try to tell it as if it were the whole story. And that's just not true. So let's get more stories. Well, thank you, everyone. We've had really a number of very insightful and provocative commentaries made by our panelists. And they had all told me before that rather than responding to one another initially, they wanted to give the floor to you in the audience. So let me invite questions and comments. And I will call on people, or depending on the number of hands, maybe group people together. Let me just ask you to, first of all, speak clearly and to limit the length of what you say. Oh, you do have a mic. Oh, good. I wasn't. Where's the mic? Is it live? Oh, excellent. Yes. Why don't you line up at the mic then? That's that's great. Cause they, there is. Uh, it probably does. Uh, there was a Jenny. Do you want to ask the first question? Yeah. But did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Is there a mic for for the audience? No. Okay, stand Wait, up and I, speak I clearly. Think, why don't you take one of these? Uh, it might yank, no, so we'll. Nancy's going to repeat. Yeah, I'll try to repeat things or the uh, person to whom the question is directed. It does. Uh, just it look does at the floor and see how far it's. This comes out. Uh -huh. 
I'm not a technician. Yeah, but there is a... Uh, Put it mildly. Ooh, oh, no. <laughs> Something came out. <laughs> I, I think, we have, to I think we have to reattach <laughs> this one. Jenny, you, you have to take it with the cord, yeah, if we're going to take it at all. Yeah. And we're going to... Yes. Okay. Uh, let's uh, start. Yes. Um, my name is Aurora Levens Morales. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about my family story in this because it both supports and contradicts things that were said here. Um, I am a Puerto Rican woman, as was my mother. She became a feminist in the Communist Party in New York City in 1949. Um, my family was linked with the Puerto Rican independence movement, with the Cuban Revolution, with the other side in Vietnam. My father um, was a scientist in a delegation to Hanoi in 1970. Um, in 1969, my mother and I were both in the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. At the same time that we were doing support work for the Black Panthers, support work for the Young Lords Organization, um, I was a member of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party at the same time that I was in consciousness raising group um, in, in the women's union. Um, I was a peace movement delegate to the Paris Peace Talks, and I was on the now Speakers Bureau for Northern New Hampshire, where we started a women's center. So I, we were both in parallel, and we, we were in parallel organizations, we were in feminist organizations that were being portrayed as all white, but we were there. Um, my mother was an anthropology graduate student at the University of Chicago writing a master's thesis that was a critique of the racism of Claude Levi-Strauss at the same time as she was involved in building takeovers to protest the firing of Marlene Dixon. So, Rosario Morales, presente. So I just wanted to say that, you know, that story weaves through the different stories that are being told here. And um, there is a process also of trying to, starting to document Puerto Rican feminist um, history Wonderful. here and in Puerto Rico. Yes, I'm let me just mention it. that another Puerto Rican woman who was an activist in, in several movements named Ana Livia Cordero, uh, and who married Julian Mayfield at one point, uh, but she herself was a doctor and Puerto Rican um, nationalist. Her papers are coming to the Schlesinger Library through the um, gift of her son, Julian Mayfield. So that's one archive that will be able to be explored here Also, um, Smith College has oral histories of my mother and myself and our papers. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the communist movement because I don't have the communist party because I don't have a personal narrative on that, but I do have some historical stuff on that, um, which is that the communist party had a real influence in the early radical in the women's liberation movement and in now, um, be, through Betty Friedan having had a very close relationship with the party through uh, working with the General Electric Union and so forth. Um, that that the party had a very conscious, since, since uh, they changed around in 1928, when there was a common turn conference, uh, the blacks from uh, the US uh, got together, uh, they, they didn't get together, were gotten together, um, were gotten together in a slightly different way from the way they had intended the black activists. That is to say, they came out with a, a, a manifesto saying there should be a separate state in the sta United States that was all black. And, and the actual black activists from the United States thought that was a terrible idea. But, 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 but this was, at any rate, the personal became political at that moment because the concept of male chauvinism was created to be, to be parallel to the nationalism that Stalin was pr doing at the time. And the women of the Communist Party took that up around 38 and changed it and added male chauvinists to it. Um, so the, and the w concept of women's liberation, the word women's libera liberation probably came not just from sort of Vietnam, but Vietnam got the concept of liberation there got that name from communist literature. So I think we, we really need to understand how important intellectually and also organizationally, when you talk about, because I was there in the early women's movement looking desperately for, for books about women's history, who had written the books on women's history? Communist Party women had written the books on women's history. So, the, so much of some of the blood that we 
that we lived through, some of the spirit that we took was left over from the Communist Party. So I just wanted to kind of, um, and you know, you, you told, talked about anti-colonialism, anti no, anti-imperialist was the anti language we used at the right. time. And so I think, I think we just have to kind of uh, look back and, and give credit to all those trends by giving credit to the Communist Party. I do agree it, it sort of New Yorkifies the movement a little bit, except when you look at how important the party was in the South. Um, okay, but, let's, but, let's hear so I'll from some there. other hands. Thank you, Jen. That was Jenny Mansbridge, please. Just put it on the stage for now. Uh, I'm Jane Mansbridge. Okay, uh, well, over here, and then we'll get some hands that are in the back of the room. Please do say your name. Okay, uh, I'm Rhoda Unger. I'm a psychologist. Um, I know a number of you here. Um, I'm concerned, I mean, I think this is a wonderful panel, but I think that one thing that has been omitted is the disciplinary focus. Many of us work through our own disciplines, and our own disciplines have written their histories. In many, in many ways, they were parallel to what people have been talking about. Some ways they were different. Um, I wanted to advocate one particular archive that's on um, the internet, on the web. Uh, it's not mine, but it's a really fine archive. It's called Psychology's Feminist Voices. It's been developed by a woman named Alexandra Rutherford, who is a historian of psychology. She has memoirs and bibliographies and anything you can name uh, for hundreds of feminist psychologists. And I think it's a magnificent resource. There are, in fact, a number of black women psychologists on there. There are Latina. There are Asians. Um, it's the sort of thing that I, you know, I really want to get p people to know about. Yeah. And I think it would be a really useful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this woman right here, and then uh, Linda, you're going to be next. Hi. I'm Louise Bernicke. I want to say out loud something I told Sarah about the distortions in the history of our movement, particularly about race, um, since everyone has mentioned Betty Friedan and the left. At the huge march in New York City in 1970, that is sort of, you know, a cornerstone of writing history and at the time doing journalism about what the women's movement was, there were women who were carrying free Angela Davis sign. Right, Free and, and Betty Friedan asked them to put it down, to put those signs down and not carry them in the march. Her reason wasn't racist. It was about communism. Think about what you know of Betty Friedan's life and that she didn't want that on top of all the other things that were uh, defiant about the women's march. And that little story has appeared in Paula Giddings' book. I mean, the same story becomes the story of um, second wave white racism. So I wanted to say that. But I also want to underline what Sarah was saying about place. I mean, probably history has also changed, that we pay more attention to place. But um, I live in New York City, and I have a good friend who many of you may know named Mary Kay Blakely um, from uh, Indiana, and when we were talking, yeah, we were talking about the splits one day, and she said, oh, that, that never happened, because Indiana had, whatever the town is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be a metropolitanist, um, they had one women's liberation group and place. No, it wasn't Bloomington. Indianapolis. Uh, Indianapolis. Some anyway, I'm sure it's true all over. So in our uh, counting of the history, what happened is that splits, like the ones we all know about, could happen in big places that had lots of different, you know, people did go looking for women's liberation. And uh, Rita Mae Brown wrote a really funny thing about looking for the women's movement in New York. You know, and you go from this place to that place to this place to this group to that group. But in so many other places, there was one group. And the difference to address the question of whether it was good or bad to have that kind of structure was that they had to work things out. 
Whereas in a big city, people would split, you know, socialist, feminist, whatever it is, they, they would split. Um, and, sh and they had something called a lockdown. So if there were di divisions in the group, <laughs> I just love this, um, they would have a lockdown. They would close the doors of the Women's Center and stay there until they had worked it out. So that's another part of the, uh, the form. Having to get um, along together, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Let's see some. Um, there's someone standing in the middle of the back there. Yeah. Just come up. There should be a line in back of. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then I did also. I recognize Linda before. So you come next after her. Well, this is just a footnote. Oh, I, and just say who you are, just please. Just make a line. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Leanne Brandon. I'm the person who made the film Anything You Want to Be this morning. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Yay. Uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, to comment, that someone said that very few organizations... Uh, Speak into the mic, please. Very few organizations survived uh, from the 70s. Well, here's one that did. New Day Films, four feminist <laughs> filmmakers founded this co-op, and we are still alive. We're in our 43rd year. There are now a hundred of us, all type A personalities, <laughs> and we had to invent the wheel. And I'm sure for Into the, the record, mic. there are other um, organizations, uh, there may be a small number of organizations that still have found a way to exist. So I didn't want to leave it that we've all sort of died. Oh, we probably have 200 films now. We've won several Academy Awards, a ton of Emmys, all that kind of stuff. And we still have these arguments and discussions and we're a little more um, uh, disciplined in how we make decisions uh, because a hundred of us yelling at each other doesn't work anymore. <laughs> it worked, well, we thought it worked with four. But anyway, I just wanted to, to say that uh, some organizations still survive and thrive and uh, for the record. And New Day still operates on a cooperative basis which requires coming to a workshop and staying there for five days a year. My daughter's a member, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, nobody famous. <laughs> uh, I want to say a couple things very quickly. First of all, in response to the story about Betty Friedan, I want to point out that McCarthyism did a tremendous amount of damage to the civil rights movement, to all kinds of movements, and to the women's movement, but the also movement. to the writing of women's movement. And yeah, so certainly in my day, that fear uh, engendered by McCarthyism was not gone. Uh, okay, the second thing close I to the mic, to say, please. Put your put the mic. Close. Sorry, uh, the second thing I want to say, and I'm speaking as a historian, but I want to make clear that I am addressing people who are not professional historians uh, as well. One of the problems we have in history as a discipline replicates the problem of women, and that is that writing about women's history is low status. Yes. I think that that's changing, but it's not changing very fast. There are very few men. Uh, someone like Bill Chafe is just an extraordinarily heroic uh, figure in that respect in, in defying that low status. That means that if we're gonna have these histories, we have to do them, and that includes people who are not professional historians. Now, one of the... Exactly, but on the other hand, we have to resist that. And the only way to resist that is by going ahead and plunging in and doing it. The second thing I want to point out is about what historians use for sources. And this has a lot to do with the dominance of New York in the stories. And that is that historians are accustomed to looking at texts. And when Rose Baxendall and I were trying to put together Dear Sisters, uh, our collection of documents from the women's movement, one of the problems that I found in representing the organization that I was part of, Bread and Roses, here in Boston, is that we didn't write a lot. People were doing things. Whereas New York, I hope I'm not insulting people here, but they were spewing out manifestos at a just geometric The publishers rate. are all in New York. And but it was also the writing that people yeah. did because so many people in the New York movement were journalists and writers. What this means for historians is you have to look at what people did. There are several ways of getting at it. The most obvious one is you have to go and interview people right. and a lot of people who are non-professionals can certainly do that. It also means 
doing something that I know has been done very well in, in uh, Chicago, where Margaret Strobel is one of my heroes, and that is asking people if they have old files, mm -hmm. documents that haven't been collected. But the final one, which I'm surprised how many people have neglected, is looking at the so-called underground newspapers that were published by the women's movement all over the country. I actually looked at uh, the newspaper, I forgot the name, but Dion will know, from San Diego State when I was doing uh, the book I'm doing with Astrid that will be out in the fall. And it was absolutely remarkable because women were doing things that are, it really forces you to question what is feminism. Women were protesting um, restrictive covenants in housing projects. They were protesting putting up new developments where there were no schools. So the final thing is it really requires a rethinking of what is a women's issue. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll have, given the line, I think we'll have to try to be very brief. Thank you. I'm Carol Giardina. I, I just want to say uh, about five things br so briefly that you <laughs> won't even understand them. First of all, I think we have to be careful not to whitewash now also. Yes. Uh, the second vice president of now, I mean Hernandez, African-American woman, Polly Murray from her the mic, the mic, the mic. The mic. For Dan says, and it changed my life, I got the idea for now from Polly Murray, who said we needed NAACP for women. For Dan says that, and that is where it came from. There's no question about it. Loretta Ross, more recently, reproductive justice, was now's reproductive rights coordinator for many years. Okay, there's a lot of things wrong with now. I like now, I'm in now, I fight with now, but I, I don't want us to just blame it all on that now was the white middle class organization, right? Okay, um, uh, we, I'll just say this really quickly. The first wave is uncanny, how the first wave of feminism is whitewashed in the same way that the second wave is. People like Mary Church Terrell, Ida, Ida B. Wells, just don't exist in the, it was a white, Alice Paul and the Karen Chapman cat, it was a white, women's movement and it was not anywhere near. I teach about this just in Flushing, where Queens College is, where I teach women's history. Four black women's suffrage clubs in Queens County alone. Do you know how many there were all across the country? Okay, uh, more quick. Okay, Latina women in the Young Lords, African American women in the Black Panthers forced those groups to be less yeah. sexist and to adopt anti-suffrage anti platforms, I mean the Panthers went from wanting to have pantherettes to trying to eradicate male chauvinism out of the organization and they did a very good job uh, with that. Now here's what goes wrong. The women, young women in my classes look on the internet, they find where, where Eldridge Cleaver says a fabulously male chauvinist wrong. thing, right? And that's it. In, in p young people's minds, you can't be racist and anti-racist at the same time. You can't be sexist and anti-sexist at the same time. But the Panthers were, the new left was, the second wave was both racist and anti-racist, and the same people are a mix of both things, usually. And, and unless somehow you can get, Sanger helps us to get birth control and also and publishes Nazis in the birth control room. She does both, yep. really good and really bad, but the students find on the internet one supreme male chauvinist thing that Stokely Carmichael said, and that's it for SNCC, you know, it's all over. It was, and then they believe that women ran away from these organizations to make women's liberation, because, and, and to try to show that these groups gave us okay, women's yeah. liberation and still contained male chauvinism is, is our work and it's really hard. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Chris Radio. Um, I wanted to comment on two things. One is Sarah Evans' comments about the need to write up the local stories. And one of the things I'm working on is trying to write Speaking up the story the of the Chief. Chicago Women's Liberation Union. Oh, good. Because I think it's really a critical part of the movement that really hasn't been addressed. In addition, I think we can't generalize from New York even to other metropolitan areas. Right. I mean, in Chicago, the Women's Union worked with Chicago now. We often worked with lesbian feminists. I mean, there was much more dialogue than what I've read about happened in New York. Uh, the second thing, different point entirely, is 
I'm struck by the fact that with the speakers so far, except for Sarah, who mentions Anne Anke's book, that nobody's really talked about the role of lesbians in the women's That's movement. Right. And I think you can't talk about the women's movement without talking about that. Um, I just want to interject. I mean, that's another piece of the history. A lot of my understanding of now comes from histories that I've read, the secondary sources. And the Lavender Menace idea, another legacy of now. So, I mean, by putting it out there, I didn't mean to like create it as this uh, straw thing. But I think that's a lot. Liberal feminism is what gets taught more, gets what, is what gets taught more in women's studies. Well, so there's that criticism moment and then a lot of organizations change over time. Yes, we need to talk about okay. that. And there was a black woman in my class who was a member of NOW in the Midwest too. But I'm talking about how these narratives get reproduced over and over. And I was glad to see that it was not the case in this conference. Okay. Hi. I'm Mary Lou Greenberg. Um, I was in the San Francisco Bay Area when the 60s hit, including women's liberation. And all those papers that were coming out of New York made a huge impact influence on us there. What I want to say is, is something that Sarah said earlier. Well, it's, it's both the, content, the uh, title of this conference, which is truly extraordinary. When you view the times now and what has been erased, the possibility of real fundamental change, the possibility of revolution, to say a revolutionary moment and women's liberation at that time is extraordinary. Also, what you said, this is that liberation was in the air at that time. And then you said that many of us thought that revolution was possible and even imminent. Right on. That is exactly what was there. But I just want to say mainly, I could go into a narrative, but I, there's not time to do that here. You know, because revolution didn't happen then doesn't mean that it was not possible. I don't think we had the leadership and the understanding to do that. There were efforts for people to come together. I worked with the Revolutionary Union and then uh, the Revolutionary Communist Party. And I just want to say that it didn't happen then, but it doesn't mean it's not needed, still needed, even more now than it was then, and that it's possible. And that's what I want to urge people to come up, talk to me. Get this special issue of Revolution newspaper that says a declaration for women's liberation and the emancipation of all humanity. We have to understand a, a lot better than we did. I'll speak personally in the 60s, but we can go forward and we can really do it this time if people get down and are serious about understanding history, but most importantly, getting out now and taking on those things that are crushing lives all across the planet and uh, particularly around the struggle around abortion. So I want to talk to everyone who wants to get down on that and thank you to the organizers for doing this conference. Hi, I'm Gray Ostrud. I was a member of Bread and Roses in Boston. Um, I would like to ask Robin in particular and any one of the rest of you who can speak to this about the question that gets, I think, not quite accurately formulated as a matter of relationships and coalitions between black women and white women. Because I've been very struck by the work in progress of Sherry Randolph, who unfortunately can't be here today, um, who's in Atlanta about Florence Kennedy, whom I remember, because she came to Seattle, where I was also in the Women's Liberation Union. And the, the question is what white feminists learned from the black power movement, which was not about building coalitions across those lines, but was about understanding power, first of all, understanding many things in terms of power, and understanding how acting collectively with people with whom you agreed ideologically, not with whom you shared necessarily in an identity, but that on the basis of political principles, you could act in ways to alter power relations. And I think that black women played, sometimes just one of them, was all that was needed to make this kind of linkage. So I just would like to ask Robin first about Black Panther Party women in other places like, you know, we're in places like Oakland who might have played this role. And if any of the rest of you have anything to say about it. That's a little anecdote. Thank you. That was Gray Ostrud. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll respond briefly. I mean, I think in a lot of ways there were those connections between uh, black women and white women activists. And I think that black women's ability to um, negotiate 
and struggle through um, the chauvinism that they face um, and the racism that they often face um, provided a kind of inspiration to white women that were there. At the same time, I feel like it, it was kind of a more symbiotic relationship in some ways. I think that black women um, sort of connected with the, some of the different struggles that white women were going through. I don't discuss this so much in my work, but I know that Emily Crosby, who's working on SNCC, for example, looking at Diane Nash and some of the early SNCC women and how they connected with um, and mentored women like Judy Richardson, who mentored um, some of the white women volunteers who came into SNCC, played such a pivotal role in their own political development. So I think that's really great work to look out for. That's Emily Crosby. I just um, have a quick oh. anecdote. Some of you may remember that uh, Florence um, Rush, uh, am I, am I, Kennedy. Florence Kennedy, we wanted one shelf in the per Berkeley Public Library for women. And there was a big sit-in because of her and a hundred women sat in until we got one shelf for women's studies. Barbara. Hi, I'm Barbara Winslow and um, I just want to, and I'm thrilled to be able to follow Gray. There's a picture of Gray and me at a Playboy Bunny demonstration in 1968 uh, in the Seattle, beginning of the Seattle archives. Speaking of archives in Washington State, there's a spectacular one called Seattle Link. If you want to learn about the early radical women's liberation movement, and they also have uh, uh, suffrage history and women's history and then the University of Washington Civil Rights and Labor History Project. It's absolutely spectacular. It's one of its kind, and uh, I urge you to look at it. And I'm sorry to toot my own horn, but there's also the Shirley Chisholm Project of Brooklyn Women's Activism. We now have the largest uh, collection of archival materials anywhere in the world about Shirley Chisholm, and a terrific website, chismproject.com. But I want to speak about something else very briefly, and it's something I want I want to make a plea from all of you. 87% of all our public school teachers are women. The children they teach, 65% of them, are students of color. And if you look at your school's curriculum, there are three women who are usually mentioned. Abigail Adams, Jane Adams, and Rosa Parks. And maybe in California, although California teachers tell me differently, sometimes Dolores Huerta. Women's history is not in the curriculum. By the way, neither is African American history and all the other ethnic studies. And as the attack on public schools grow, the curriculum is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And I beg you all, and it's not just because I'm in a school of education, and it is not just because I speak in the public schools, and the children in Brooklyn have never heard of Shirley Chisholm that unless we get the names of all the women that we write about, all the women we're interested in, into the school's curriculum, what will happen is the school children of America will be bereft of their real history, a wide range of different kind of role models, and the only people who will end up doing women's history, for example, will be those people who went to the elite, private schools where it can be taught and the elite colleges. So please, go back to your communities, look at the curriculum, and get involved in the fight for public education. Hi, I'm Judith Ezekiel, and thank you, Sarah, for the plug. Um, I wrote a book called Feminism in the Heartland, which was written through from 1979 through 1990-something. Took about 20 years to get done. But um, I wanted to make a few comments. One, in honor of this conference, I would like to call for us all to use the term women's liberationist. There's been such an elision between the term radical women, radical feminism, and feminist, and among other things, this is eliminating the history of socialist feminism, which I hope that Chris will be uh, correcting in part in the work on Chicago. But uh, I do think that the word women's liberationist is more accurate, it's more exciting, it's, so I'd call for everyone to use the term women's liberationist. Um, I wanted to make one comment in part to Roz about structure, which is that in Dayton, um, from there was one single organization mostly from 1969 
1975, lots of offshoots. But the structure was, it was organized around consciousness raising groups. I counted 42 that existed bet between six months and 10 years in time, some actually beyond that. And they always had different structures experimented with. They had coordinating committees with one member from each group, or they would alternate among the groups. It was constantly changing, and it was never right, but it was a very creative. And as far as membership, impact on the media, and every criteria, every indicator I could find, probably as effective as any more structured group that followed later on. So um, I don't think that it's an either or, and I think it, you know, it was, there are ways to combine those structures. And then a, a side anecdote about now is that in Dayton, all these, it was a very radical movement. Dayton is supposedly the typical American city. They do every survey on every, every um, presidential election. You've got the BBC and Le Monde. You've got everyone from around the world trying to figure out what America thinks. So that's what I'm telling you right now is what America thinks. And uh, so all these rad very radical women who had been in the, in the civil rights movement and in the new left um, all thought they should, cr they were, and many had been housewives and you know been the same as many of the other women. They thought there should be a now because now would attract those mythical other women that they weren't. And so they kept creating nows. And they were too straight and nobody wanted to join them. And either they fizzled out or the women all came into Dayton Women's Liberation or the Women's Center or the Freedom of Choice uh, Coalition, et cetera. So um, that's just another uh, itinerary. And I would have so much to say. I thank you so much for this conference, but I'll stop there. Ooh, okay. All right, I actually have a question. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Oh, okay. Hold the mic close. Okay. Um, I'm Nargis from Antioch College, so and my question is, I'm a history student, also an art student, but my question is how do we change how history is written, because history is written by white men most of the time, and how do we teach history differently, because right now history is kind of, kind of like, we're learning dates, names, past, the end, but I feel like you know history is re related to the way we live and the way we choose to live, so I'm kind of curious to hear you guys' opinions on that, thank you. I'm going to just start, but the first thing you do is start writing it. Um, and everybody at this table has done that and is doing it. Um, the second thing is some of us have spent our whole careers teaching women's history. Um, and it's been a totally thrilling thing to do, but I, I do think that there is an ongoing issue about the place of women's history in the curriculum mm -hmm. and the place of um, the books that we write in the broader culture and whether they get attended to and whether they shape broader narratives. And that is where somehow we've got to really work on ways of um, getting, getting the story out and reframing things so that we don't keep you know, dealing with these versions of the past that we know better and yet, um, the people who are saying them don't know better because they haven't heard. Let's yeah, go right ahead. Uh, my name is Quinlan Pulley King, and I'm a high school student from Missouri. And, um, and I also have, I'm doing a National History Day research project, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, and I've gone to nationals twice before, so I'm um, in, in love with the competition. But I have a relatively specific question. Um, it's discussed how large of a role the media played um, in the movement to get the attention of the public in terms of demonstration and marches, but how much of a role did women who began to work actually in the journalism field, yet not directly with the movement, such as Catherine Graham, um, what kind of a role did they play in the liberation movement? I think there were two ways. One is some women were asked by their publishers or editors to go and investigate this new thing called the women's movement and came to it with some indifference and became converted. And those people were quite extraordinary. Right. Another thing the media did, and this was something that was really very, um, very egregious, is that it continually portrayed the first woman who did this, the first woman who did that, the first woman who did this, and, and, and none of those stories describe the difficulties that that first woman faced. How did she get childcare? How did she, met, did, she get, did she get promoted? Did she get laid off? 
So the, a lot of the media, when you actually look at the media coverage, during this, particularly in the 70s, is about the first woman's story, but you don't get the full story of her life. Let me just say that we're approaching 12.30. I do want to enable people to have this uh, photo. And a few minutes ago, I saw several people in line. And Rochelle Ruthchild, I was thinking we'd have to end with her. And so I think that's still the case. So I think a few of you at the end of the line, I'm sorry, we just won't have time for your questions. But there can be informal conversation after. But let's take, we're going to take three. Please go ahead. Hello. My name is Martha Cotera. And I have written extensively on Chicana feminism, Chicana history. Uh, in, a, in response to the curriculum issue in Austin, we're taking matters into our own hands. And we're developing the Saturday and after school academies at the community level that will uh, deal with minority history in the greater context and women's history. Now, multi-ethnic, everybody. The other thing that I was going to say, for those of you that have a hand in hiring at the university level, because that's where we're getting materials to incorporate into our community curriculums, why are we still hiring men of all races and ethnicities that do not know women's history? Thank you. You know? <laughs> and why are we still hiring women that do not know minority women's history, you know? Um, and I'll just give you examples. Uh, I get, I'm, I'm a mentor to a lot of students because I work with archives also for all my life. And invariably, they'll come from all over the state of Texas and they'll say, well, the guys, I, I say, well, what happened to your, uh, your university? Why can't you get mentoring there for your project? Well, the men don't know women's history. And the women that teach women's history don't know Chicana history, OK? If you're hiring, please make sure you're hiring educated people. <laughs> uh, I'm Julie Alcott. I'm um, hopefully currently finishing a book on the 1975 International Women's Year Conference in Mexico City. Um, so the first thing I would say is that I've done research all over the world for this, um, for this book, and I have realized how immensely privileged we are to have the kinds of archives that we have here of personal papers of feminist activists and women's activists in the United States. So those of you who have not already donated your papers, I urge you to do so, and with the fewest strings attached possible. Um, because it makes a huge difference in the way we can write that stuff. I guess the other thing is that, and I, I intend this as a question, but we don't really have time, is that there have been these gestures toward thinking about the women's movement in an international context, but I haven't heard much of it. And it makes a tremendous difference, really, to think about right. what's going on in other parts of the world and these women's movements who are following very different rhythms and priorities than right. here and are not just sort of kid sisters of the US and New York movement. Right, and teaching each other. Hi, I'm Rochelle Ruthchild, and I wanted to follow up on what was just said. Women's history is more than, I think it's very important what you've said, but women's history is more than the history of the United States. And it's really important to think of women's history in a global context, and also not just the history of the former British Empire. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> And I want to say also in that vein that there are, there is archival material in other countries. I've looked at research and archives in Russia and the Soviet Union, and there's a lot of it. So it isn't only here. So please, when you talk about, when you have conferences, include the countries in which also there have been revolutions. And we can't just, uh, and we shouldn't just obliterate the history of what that revolution was and say it was just totally a failure. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, I think say. we do have well, to conclude I, at this point. Red uh, Stockings has published its huge archive, and you can get yes. it from Cengage, and it has a lot of the stuff that I talked you, about. You can it. buy it directly from them, too. On March uh, 8th I, of this year, 91 women's organizations in Venezuela came together and issued a feminist manifesto that is incredibly radical. It's on YouTube. Look it up. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank our panelists with some applause. I wanted to introduce you to Dion because she didn't know anything about it.
you've edited this magazine.